but I can only make so much. You know, it's just me and my two hands in my attic or in my dining room, and there's going to be a ceiling to the amount of money that I can make. And making money is a goal of mine. You know, that is a part of owning a small business. You want to succeed. And it's not just about, you know, your quality of life or what. It's not just about that. If you succeed, then you can bring more to more people. So it's a win-win, really. Um, but really, I wanted to impress my husband and my mother, who at one point said, you can't make it as an artist. So, <laughs> mom, if you're watching this, you really, really inspire me with that. So, um, anyway, um, so then I started to think about how can I go beyond my own two hands and my own time. And my first idea was to have someone help me make, we call them blanks. So, make the animal to a certain degree, and then I would finish it. Well, that was great, except, and he did a great job, Talbot, who works for me now, um, except it takes me a few minutes to do this, and it takes me another few hours to finish. So in proportion, it wasn't going to make my business grow, because he was doing something that I could do relatively quickly. So then I ended up with a huge pile of blanks, and still not more stuff to sell. Okay, so, um, let's, yeah, let me look at the, um, we have a little picture here to show you where we started. So eventually, I wanted to get out of my house. I felt like that was important. And I moved out of my attic um, into the mill, which was a <laughs> dilapidated barn, but we loved it. It had a lot of character and no plumbing and no heating. So I would run home. <laughs> I would come back. It was only a tenth of a mile away. It was right around the corner. But that worked well for me for a while. Um, setting up a space designated for your work is, um, is important, I think. Much better than a run too. Um, can I ask you guys, if you don't mind, who has a business already? And who has an idea that they want to involved into a business. Okay. Okay. Cool. That helps me um, know what to touch on. So we moved into the mill and Talbot moved away. He, he found a job that could offer him more time. And I was still itching to sell. Um, let's see, actually before he left, he helped me do a couple of things. We made a few kits that were pictures you know, step-by-step -step photographs. And so that it was a kit with a paper pamphlet that came with it. And I sold those, and I started selling some wool. But I still felt like there was just all this possibility that I was not tapping into. And I, I knew that if I could teach, um, and if I could make videos, that I could reach a wider audience. So I started to try and find someone that could help me film video tutorials, basically. And I met Kyla through our, our kids go to school together. And my son went to her house um, for her son's birthday party. And I, I didn't know the deceptive at that point. And he came home with a DVD of skits that they made at the birthday party, labeled, like with a cover and titles and everything. And I was like, I was like, when did you do this? He goes, at the party. And I was like, how did this woman have like a dozen kids there, do the cake, you know, all the stuff that you do at a birthday party and make these DVDs, I have to read her. And so I approached Kyla and he said, can you do this, you know, for me um, professionally? And she's like, I don't know about that, but I'll do it. And we filmed a few things that summer. And that's when things really get started. Did you have a question? Or were you just? <laughs> Um, okay, so then Kyla joined me in the middle. Alright, so let's, um, let's talk about the, the idea of the concept and starting to, you know, I think, like when I think, I write things down and it's a crazy mess. And, but that's okay, because you just, you just brainstorm. 
and then how to like hone in on your concept. So some of you may be beyond this step, but I'm going to um, talk about it a little bit. So the first, the first item on the on the outline is your concept. So mine was growing my business by teaching and selling supplies. That I felt like was the avenue that was going to take me where I wanted to go. So write down your goals and your direction. What are your goals? Think in terms of money. You know, are you supplementing an income that your family already has? Do you need to support your family? Um, do you do you, you know, maybe you want job flexibility. You want a job that you have a little more control over. Um, think in terms also of your quality of life. So that would be the flexibility. I really want to be more a part of community. I was tired of being just an artist in our studio. I felt like I wanted to do things like this. I wanted to, you know, interact more and um, get out. So that's one thing to start shaping your business is, you know, what does the big picture look like? Another thing to think about, is it just going to be you? Is it just, do you want to stick with, this is what I'm going to make and sell, and that's it? Or is there the possibility that you might want to hire uh, other people? If you stay solo, there's, there's going to be a limit to what you can do. That's just, that's it. And, you know, there's also social media, bookkeeping, taxes, um, there's all these other business things besides the fun part um, that maybe you could dole those out to other professionals to help you with. That would free up some of your time. Um, growing your income as a solo person, one thing that you could do is you could try to increase the value of what you sell. So you could you create demand somehow. I created demand by making the, the video tutorials. Um, or by, just on Etsy, before I even started the video tutorials, as people began to recognize my things and as they got better and better, I was able to charge more um, per item, which pays me more per hour, basically. Um, let's see. So, if you're going to grow and employ others and you're not, you know, you're not going to limit yourself that way, then uh, there's a lot more you can do because you can start delegating and um, assigning a lot of tasks over to others, which um, I've learned I've learned to do. After you kind of think about these things, you'll want to really develop your product so you have something that you're making um, that you think is pretty good, or maybe you're already selling, or maybe it's a service. You know, maybe you're, um, maybe you're cleaning, or I mean, it really applies across the board. <clears throat> Get really good at it. See what other people are doing. Um, measure out their, you know, how what are they charging? How are they advertising? Like really, you know, look around and get a feel for the market. What can you do that's different? You know, what can you bring to this? product or service that sets you apart. One thing that might be different is, you know, you offer your product internationally or like where does the uh, where does the competition offer their product? You might do craft shows, you might go on Etsy, um, use a website. So you may surpass their distribution. Maybe you can improve upon it. We were talking about, um, you know, if you've seen an idea and you're inspired that I, by that idea, but you think you can improve upon that idea or change that idea, that's that's fair game. I mean, that's that's a real possibility. So think about that. All right. When I started needle felting, one of my kind of little hangups was. It was all new to me, so I didn't know how they were going to hold up in terms of time and quality. So that was one thing that I wanted to figure out 
and I would take wire armatures and you know bend them back and forth, <laughs> do my own little thing, um, product testing. But I wanted to know that what I was passing over was what I said it was, and that was going to hold up well. And they actually, um, it turns out they really do. It's been nine years now, and no one has anything that's broken or messed up. So understanding what you're providing and making sure that it's good quality, that's really important. There may be some things that make you and your work or your business more valuable than other businesses. So maybe um, you're more skilled, you've had some special training, you've had an apprenticeship, um, you have unbeatable customer service, which you should have anyway, no matter what. Um, that's something we really um, you can offer a better price than someone else and one of our things that we um, strive for is less packaging um, we try to be eco-friendly we try to be you know we try to recycle and reuse as much as possible so and I'm just very aware of the materials that I use um, for example Needle felters, because they have these sharp needles, you need, when you're stabbing, you need something to receive the needles. So in the old days, we worked on foam, um, upholstery foam. And I was going through upholstery foam, and after you stab it for a while, it just degrades and you have to throw it away. So I know it's not good when they make it. I know it's not good to throw it away. And one of the first products that I developed was our Stabit Wabbit um, felting surface, which is burlap. And we, we have a little um, hole here with a drawstring, and we fill it with three pounds of rice. This way, it's all natural. I mean, you can throw this in your compost. So it lasts longer, it, it works better, that kind of stuff. That's a, that's a selling point. That's People like that. We also like to work with other small businesses, so whenever possible, I use other handmade, um, other handmade items. This is a tool that I created that facilitates um, making shapes in needle felting. I'm not going to bore you with the details, but trust me, it's a, it's a miracle wand. Um, but I met a woodworker in New York when I was up there at a um, farmer's market. Kyla was at the beach. I was in the mountains, and all week we had beach and mountain waters. <laughs> she was sending me pictures of the beach, and I was sending her pictures of the mountains. And I said, hey, you know, I've got this idea. Is this something you can make? And now he's on his third tool for us. Um, so that's, you know, he's just one guy in his woodworking shop, and that's the kind of businesses that I like to um, support. Other farmers, other small businesses, other craftspeople. And I let people know that, you know, that's, pitch whatever is your strength and your niche and your talent. Okay, there's things that you're going to have to do. Oh, I jumped my head. See that top left one? Back. Okay. Um, there's things that you're going to have to do that I can't um, advise you on, like uh, maybe get a business license. You don't always need a business license if you are just making something and selling it. Um, you don't need a business license. You can do that under your social or any whatever. Um, sales and use tax ID. So if you're, you have to buy material to make your product, you can get a sales and use tax ID. You can also do that under your own, if you're still a proprietor, under your own social. And you will have an ID that you can buy wholesale. Um, you know, things like, am I going to be a sole proprietor, an LLC, or a corporation? You will talk to a lawyer and an accountant um, because nobody understands that stuff except for lawyers and accountants. Um, we found, anyway. <laughs> the library is a um, great resource. So is the, um, the Maryland, oh, they keep changing their name, Small Business they took and Technology the Development. They took out the tech. What's that? Just Small Business Development Center. Small Business Development Center. They're here to help you. Um, 
either help you with that or point you in the direction with someone who can help you with that. At one point, I was going to open a cafe, and I think it's a, still a really good idea because there's no food in fair health. And um, if anybody wants to work with me on that, actually, Tacey and I, we're going to do that. We've developed a business plan. Um, I was going to meet with uh, SCORE. So SCORE is another very good resource. They pair business people with you, and you basically have a mentor that will help you specifically with your ideas and your plan. Uh, a business plan. I did not have a business plan. I just knew <laughs> I had an idea of what I wanted to do, and I was able to grow slowly. I was able, just the way things worked out for me, I was able to grow bit by bit. I didn't have to take out a loan. I didn't have to buy a property. Um, so it, just depending on how you evolve a business plan uh, might be a good idea. I don't know what's in one, but uh, there are people who do. I also relied a lot on just people that I knew. I had worked for um, Bit of Britain, which is uh, for supplies. I did retail there, and I really admired the owner of that business. He grew it from a garage to an international mail order business. And I didn't hesitate to call him up and say, you know, hey, what, when it's convenient for you, I know you're really busy, I'll buy you lunch, you know, just I have some questions. And people want to help. I also contacted um, the owner of Outback Trading Company, and he met me and talked to me. And they have, they've been doing this and they have great advice and, you know, I'm sure like if you network or have a relative or you can find someone that is going to add to your pot, that's going to put something into your business bank that's helpful to you. So don't be afraid to ask for help. You cannot do it alone. It's too much. Friends, relatives, acquaintances, just go for it. Okay, what else? Yeah. There's, um, Laura got some books out. There's so many good books. There's so much online. You can read, you can research. I read a book, oh, it's at the end of the, um, it's at the end of your pages. It's a terrible title. I think it's terribly negative. It's like, how not to run a small business or something. Um, yeah, mistakes small business owners make and how to avoid them. I prefer a more positive slant on things, but it was a very helpful book. It, it talked about, it used as an example of all things McDonald's. And not a fan, but the author's point was what McDonald's did was standardize. And they made it so that no matter where you went, you were going to get the same service, the same quality, the same item. And even if you're not going to franchise, if you think about your business in terms of franchising, you're going to create a well-run machine. You're going to have procedures. You're going to have training. You know, you're going to have. You're going to be able to delegate because everyone that comes in, every employee that comes in to help you, is going to know exactly what their job is, um, how to do it, and that's important. I think business owners, small business owners, get so hairy and hassled because they feel like they've got to do this, and they've got to do that, and they've got to do more, and people want more, and it's just you, and it's you against the world, and you're the only one who can do it. Don't, if you can avoid it, don't fall into that. You know, if you can, if you know how thing, you want something packaged, you can teach someone how to package, and then that's their job. So, just thinking in terms of how to, uh, that's a more scientific, I guess, um, methodical, how to delegate, how to create patterns and processes that are established that everybody understands. Um, like I said, you're not. I'm not going to franchise, but it's it's a good way to think. So that was a really helpful book. Actually, John Nunn recommended that book to me, 
and um, I got a lot out of it. And there's tons of books, and like I said, tons on this. Okay. Does anybody um, have anything before I move on to logos and branding? Um, anything that they want to ask or that might I might be able to cover before we move on about getting started? Anyway. Okay. 